And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Marv Matura, who as a result of his car accident, had a near-death experience, which we're going to learn about and more. Marv, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. Marv, if you don't mind, let's start on the day that this car accident happened and go from there. Okay, well, uh, the accident was um, typical teenage crash and burn. I was uh, 17 years old and my friend had just got this 1972 LTD Ford 400, you know, getaway car. And, you know, we're just starting the party. We've got the beer in the back, you know, reefer lit and just ready to party it up. I think it was just before Easter weekend. So back in those days, we had to go to the liquor store and stock up for the weekend because all of there was, wasn't uh, private stores back then. <laughs> anyway, so we, uh, my friend was just a nut bar behind the wheel and he spun out of control passing two lanes on coming traffic and we jumped the curb and hit the brakes and hit a high tension power pole at about 60 miles an hour and of course then in those days there was no um we didn't have a seat well there were seat belts we didn't wear them so i recall uh the impact and anybody who's had a car accident i think what i recall the most is the the sound it's a, a sound that you'd, you'd never hear that, you know, and it gets in your memory, such loud crashing bang. And um, I felt myself come off the seat of the car and go into the windshield. And I know I, I hit the um, rear view mirror, which probably saved my life because any kind of breakage in that could slows your body down. And so the, the breaking of the, um, rear view mirror, which I think hit me right about here. And then I hit the windshield and came back into the seat like that, just like a crash test dummy. You know, I looked over at my friend and I thought he was dead. He was leaning over the, uh, the steering wheel, all crushed and bleeding from various parts of his face and head. And I was wide awake, you know, I was, I was conscious. And, uh, I just remember putting my head, hand to my head and came back all completely blood. And so uh, in those days, you know, you're, you're bulletproof. You, you don't think of your mortality when you're that age, at least I didn't. And uh, I still thought, well, why can't we just put this car in reverse and back out of here and go home? So I, I got out of the car and then I started to realize, well, no, this is a little more serious. Seeing the crashed car, seeing it smoking and the engine, that there was no going home. My, my first thought was maybe I'll just walk home and clean up, you know, this, this can't happen. This is, you don't, you, you're just so um, bulletproof when you're that age, you know, but slowly it didn't take long before I realized I can't walk. Um, I'm bleeding profusely. I better go sit down. And by this time, um, people were uh, started, stopped for the accident. It, we didn't hit anybody again. It was just us, thankfully. And, um, yeah, a nurse came by who uh, immediately started putting pressure on my wound to stop the bleeding uh, with some kind of towel she found. And I I, I remember her uh, holding me uh, to, to save my life uh, until the ambulances came. Now, when the ambulances came um, and the police, because it was in those days, just like two young kids and they saw the booze and the whatever else and the guitars in the car and... Uh, they treated us like crap. You know, I remember I couldn't even wipe my face, got in the ambulance and the police said, take them down to the hospital, whatever. And uh, so again, I, I probably should have been um, kept there for the night because I had cracked my skull open and I had internal bleeding really badly, but they, uh, you know, uh, stitched me up and, uh, and sent me home. You know, my, my parents, uh, my dad, I remember he came, I said, Dad, I gotta pick me up, you know. And uh he looked, took one look at me and said, Holy shit, you know, like got home and you know, my mom's crying and uh I I was now starting to feel the real effects because you're in shock, but I was starting to feel the real effects of internal bleeding on your brain and uh it was swelling up like this. But I, I went down to bed, which was the absolutely wrong thing to do. If you ever have a major concussion, you, you should stay awake as long as you can. And that, that was like totally 
you know, looking back on it, was just a recipe to die that night. So I was lying in my bed with uh, a pain in my head that was getting worse and worse and worse. And um, all of a sudden I was released from the the pain uh, uh, in my head. And I could look down at my myself sleeping on the or lying on the bed, and I I knew that I'm am de dead, um, I'm not I'm not there anymore, and um, <clears throat> I, I remember then um, a very peaceful, quiet. It was kind of a bluish light that was glowing in that plane. I could see um, more than just my room. Uh, and my bed, I could see uh, like a, a a plane stretching everywhere and along uh, um, infinity. It seemed to me, um, but I was very at peace and at calmness with uh, with what had happened. And I, you know, I just accepted at that point that yeah, I'm 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 done. Um, this is this is the end. And uh, where am I headed to next? You know, is this that transition? Uh, I don't know how. It wasn't that long that I was uh, up there. Um, I remember my, my mom came into the room and I remember her watching her come in and they, my mom and dad were quite religious. They, you know, they were in the Catholic church, uh, uh, Ukrainian Catholic church and where they have um, things like holy water, uh, blessed water. So my mom came in with a, a, a bottle. They'd always have a bottle of blessed water around the house. You know, to uh, cleanse it and do, I guess, moments like this. You know, and I remember my mom; she was crying and uh, addressing my my head with um, with the water and, and washing my face. And then I realized, oh, I I want to tell my mom how much I love her. I don't know if I've told her that. I got to. I, I I how do I? I and um, I hope. And then and at that moment. I slipped back into my body uh, for, for for as long as I knew because like then I remember she finished. I said, "Hey, mom," but but she was just leaving the room actually, and then then I was back into my body, and I said, "Mom, I love you. Thank you so much for all you've done for me." And she said, "Oh, that's okay. That's you know, that's just just you get rest." And uh, I think at that at that point or shortly thereafter, I I just passed out from the. The, the pain and I, I realized I, I thought for sure this I'm, I'm not going to wake up I'm not I'm, and uh, I don't recall anything else of that night I think it just wasn't my time I don't remember uh, any dreams if I did have them I just remember uh, waking up with with at some point in the morning and realizing hey I, I'm not dead I'm I'm here and again with the with excruciating pain in, in my in my head, and I looked in the mirror and I don't know if you know what happens like when you get major internal uh, bleeding it all comes down into your tissues, and my eyes are starting to swell up so they were almost swollen shut, um, and blackened and blue and and whatnot and um, anyway um, I was alive <laughs> so could barely see I think I only see out of one eye. The other eye was completely swollen shut, this one here. And, um, you know, um, my mom then <laughs> I woke up and we went to the, she took me to the hospital in emergency and they said, holy shit, you should have never been let go last night. You've got major trauma. But they said, there's nothing we can do about it now. We can't, you know, you've got, you've obviously survived it, but there, we we can't uh, drain the blood or anything. That is too much into the tissues. So anyway, I, I at that point began the slow recovery back to normal, which took about a year before um, I was not visibly um, damaged, you know, <laughs> like somebody just kicked the crap out of me. So that's uh, that was that was it, you know. And since that time, um, I've never been afraid of dying. Um, you know, not that I was before, but it's, uh, you know, I, I know uh, there is life after death. Uh, it's, I can, in myself, I can totally justify it that, you know, I, I died and I, I came back for whatever reason. But uh, there was, maybe it was the holy water, who knows. But I, uh, I, I was gone. I was, yeah. And 
I, I probably for three or four minutes, maybe but again, I don't, it's hard to talk. Time is a little different on the other side, you know, Marv, thank you for sharing your experiences with us. <laughs> you grew up in a religious household. Did this change your religious or spiritual beliefs at all? Uh, no, it didn't. Uh, it didn't change my religious uh, beliefs. No, um, we were we were of course told there's life after death and all that. So, that, or taught that's part of the faith that you you the spirit the soul carries on. Did you notice after your experience that you had any new abilities that you didn't have previously? No, no, I don't think so. I think as as we were mentioning, we were talking earlier, I've always been psychic. Um, and, you know, I, even as, as a child, I could astral travel. And I always thought that was, I thought everybody could. Um, so I, well, I don't, I don't think so. I, I guess, you know, also as a child, I had horrific nightmares um, and I still, I still get them. But they, I, what what changed for me? But this is before the accident. Was learning, learning not to fear the monsters, the act, the uh, the other side. They they can't hurt you, if you're if you're the only thing that can hurt you is the fear, and I believe that that's same with death. That death can't hurt you. The but the fear of death can certainly hurt you, and uh, paralyze you. So that's something that just reinforced that, I guess, for me. Uh, that you've you've got to uh, you know st stand up to the monsters because uh, they they can bring you down. I guess yeah. Were your astral travels anything like the out of body experience you had in your room? No, <laughs> that's interesting. It's it wasn't. No, that was different because that that was that was on. Uh, it was just so peaceful and so clear uh, to, to go to, uh, ast astral travels are, are more like to places. And I guess I was just in the transitional phase, but, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of astral travel. It is, it always seems to be, um, just too unpredictable. <laughs> so, would you say that when you're astral traveling, you're clearly out of your body and understand that like you were when you were in your room? No, it's, it's different. Actually, I think that's, that's different because you, you feel you're certainly out of your body when you're astral traveling, but you're, you're connected to your body. It, it's, there's a, a strong a string that will not let you go. Whereas that experience was definitely no connection to the body so the cord the has just so the cord broken yeah that's that's i think yeah for sure there that's the difference for sure because when you astral travel you you know that you're still alive you, you don't you don't know you don't die the same way and you don't that cord uh, I, I guess the silver cord as a lot of people say uh was was take was gone mm. it's different than astral travel because it's like when you're astral travel you're always kind of like I, I describe it maybe like you're on a string you're you're and uh and, and also when you snap back into your body it it it's it's noticeable like you whereas on that day that i had a near-death experience it wasn't well did you notice any change in your psychic abilities after your nde uh, maybe <laughs> i i think what i what it what more what more then is again my my belief that it was you got to make the most of each moment because life is we're mortal um but i all you know even as a child i i had a very clear sense of mortality when i was very little like uh, a lot of people never uh never come to that realization of how how mortal we are i guess uh, until they're until they're really near death but i i remember very clearly uh, when i was in grade two i guess something like that I remember it was just after the Christmas holidays and I realized Christmas is over and it's not coming to back again. That was it. That's the life is not, you know, it doesn't repeat. And, uh, at that, even at that young age, I thought, wow, it's, uh, you, you got to make the most of each moment because life is so short and, uh, it, it's over. So that, the near death experience, uh, first of all, of course, made me, 
uh, you know, uh, reaffirm the belief that the death is not to be feared, um, and um, that the time that we're given here on on Earth is is so vitally important to not be uh, wasted. So I started, you know, just started came started the same path really that I'm on even to this day. That uh, I every every moment is valuable. Yeah. As you mentioned earlier, when we spoke about you being a psychic, you also told me that you're a tarot reader. How yeah. did you get into that? Yeah, tarot cards. Yeah, well, um, when I was always interested in metaphysics, and I got introduced to the tarot uh, maybe in my 20s, and I never really developed it big time, but I learned I could see into cards really easily, like the regular deck, which is based on the tarot deck, of course. And... Um, I would read cards for people at parties and families and friends. And I just, it was kind of bizarre the way I'd, I, I not bizarre, but uh, it, it would just be e easy for me to to do. And the cards are very much like, say, a dousing stick when you're finding water under underground. They are um, sensitive to the vibrations that are occurring through the metaphysical bond of you and the the seeker and um <clears throat> so you know you don't really need the card well you need the card I, I need them and i you just like you need the willow stick some people could just find the water without the willow stick but the willow stick is a tool of metaphysical vibrations of that you can get into and uh anyway so um it was 2020 not that long ago and i'm, I'm a musician also performing and there was no places to play because COVID had locked everything down except at the farmer's market, they'd still allow you to play there. And so I, I was doing a set there every farmer's market twice, three times a week. And it just occurred to me after one of my sets, I thought, wow, you know, maybe I could make a little extra money. I'm here already. I could set up a little card reading booth. Came right out of the blue. And uh, that idea just wouldn't let me go until I saw it to fruition. You know, I approached the market. I said, would you like a card reader here? And they said, sure, but you need a booth and you need all the regalia. And so it took a while to get all that together. And and I, as I started to go back into the tarot, I just walked into a bookstore one day and picked up a, a new tarot deck, which uh, literally changed my life too. This this is the deck I use, the, the Millennium Toth, Toth Tarot. Um, and um, it's a relatively new deck. I think it's going to be an enduring deck. It certainly spoke to me, and it, it, it inspired the book I wrote, the Five Card Pentagram Tarot, um, which is available online, and you know, and you can find it. Uh, I, I, I and I'm still I'm, re I'm working on another book already on on the tarot more, into a more deep dive. And um, so anyway, it, I started just got a tent in the tarot deck and started reading fortunes and it just took off from there. And right now it's, it's probably half or better of my income uh, that I do professional psychic readings and with the tarot deck primarily. And I've done thousands of them, I think really helping people forward with their lives and their deep questions about where they're going in their future. Are you doing this in person or online? Yeah. Yeah, I do it mostly in person, but I'm also available online. I've st I started just online this year. Uh, so I'm with a, a, a psychic group out of, uh, I think they're Cal, no, Florida. Um, uh, Mystic Affair, or rather Spiritual Blossom is the site I'm on. But I'm also on my own site, like at my Universe Psychic site. I have a scheduling page and I take, take uh, readings from all over the world there. So you can log on to my website and... And I will uh, engage with you at the tarot uh, again. With the metaphysical world, the uh, uh, the distance doesn't matter uh, the same as as it does, you know, in our physical world. So I find uh, online readings just as useful and as engaging as in person readings. Do you ever find or hear back from your clients? Oh yeah, that yeah, what yeah. information that you give them is verifiable. Yeah, yeah, very very much so. Yeah. Um, hmm. They're usually amazed at, at their reading and how much I nail them, <laughs> nail them, uh, um, or you know, see into their lives, past, present, and future. Do you also see future events of like the world in general? Yes, I do. 
Like, have you seen anything special that's going to happen in 2024? I, I haven't looked into that too much yet. I, I, I keep meaning to. I know the 24 is already rolling along, but um, but I, I I see, you know, I can just tell you right now that uh, it's, it's going to be a rough ride for all of us where there's continuing chaos everywhere um, and mounting, which I actually predicted in 2023. Um, and it's just seems to, you know, amplify right now. Hmm. So it, it's interesting. The tarot can be used in this regard too. And I, I've, I've often seen people like online doing this, the, the, the thing that you have to be very careful with when you're engaging, like say with a, you're looking at somebody else's life that they haven't asked you for permission to do, um, which is sort of, yeah, is that ethical? I don't know. You have to really clear your mind of um, your own bias toward the the person. Like just a podcast ago, uh, somebody asked me about our, our leader here in Canada, Pierre Trudeau, or not Pierre, uh, <laughs> Justin. His dad was Pierre Trudeau in my age. Uh, but uh, he, uh, what you said, so I've, I've got a personal bias about him. And so that often gets into the card. So I really, you have to clear that bias as much as you can. And that is same with, uh, with people too. You can't, you can't make any prejudgments from your own mind. It's just channeling a, a higher vibration. So, um, yeah, I just, it's just caution of that, you know, like I said, I've seen some readers like, especially like your, uh, Trump, people have strong feelings about him and then again they're asking they're they're looking at the, their cards to see what they say about trump and usually their their bias is coming through into what their their fortune telling and again no fortune telling is 100 percent of true and also they like, have to be careful with the time factor because uh, the time is um is a little different even nostradamus would point that out like his his predictions uh they're pretty close to the time but they're not exact um Sylvia Brown too. She would always say that I, I, I see this happening, but I, I, I don't. I can say it's before twenty twelve, but perhaps it'll be twenty twenty four. What are some of the even, even Jesus said that you know we don't know the time, you know the, the greatest mystic of all time, if you will, uh, he couldn't couldn't actually predict time exact. Yeah. What are some of the other misconceptions that people have about tarot reading? Well, I, I see a lot of this, especially with working at the fairs. Uh, a lot of people think it's evil, it's devil's work, um, and um, it, it's it's not good for your for your spirit or your soul or your everlasting life, whatever it might be. So, um, and and that's uh, you know to a large point still with a lot of um, magical of metaphysical people. Uh, uh, you know, like as Bob Dylan said, you got to serve somebody. And, you know, in the spiritual community, of course, you're in a very tempting position to abuse your power. Certainly the priests of the Catholic Church have done that. Right? It's, it's, it's dangerous to become a psychic or it's dangerous to become a spiritual worker because the temptation is is very great to use that power for a negative purpose. And I think there are some fortune tellers out there that are are serving the left side, as it's called in the metaphysical world, n not not the good side, not the you know the light, I suppose. And they, if any if the, any of them are doing it to aggrandize their own ego, that is um, that's evil. That's that's wrong, and you can't uh, uh, um, you you can't you can't be doing that. <laughs> but the temptation is there. It's like, uh, you know, the, we're willful creatures. We have the will. We want what we want. But uh, thy will be done is a contradiction to that. And that's, the I think, the difference between the, the left side and the right. I, I, though, I'm just using those terms, right? Uh, but like as Dylan said, you you got to serve somebody. I, I serve, if for lack of, I, I call it the, the universe. But it's God, it's the one, the Allah, whatever, uh, however you determine that higher power that is the benevolent creator, the, the, uh, the, when you become, uh, you realize that 
you're not you're not creating the magic. And, and no matter how many spells you you k and, and spin around with your wand and crystals, whatever like that, it all has to come from some source. And when you start believing it's coming from you, um, that is very dangerous, very dangerous for your soul. And you think you can do that, but you have to uh, be 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 founded. And also, too, like you know, the um, if you journey into the other side, there's it's not all peaches and roses on there. There are evil forces out there in the world that you come in contact with that normal people don't, um, or who who ignore that. They they see it's it's less of a factor in their life. Uh, so. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Reading is is a, a a closer moment to the creator, the good the good guy, not the bad guy. Before we started, you mentioned that you have a UFO story. Can oh you, yeah, yeah. Can you share that with us? For sure. Okay, so um, I live here in the Okanagan uh, of British Columbia, and there's a uh, these beautiful lakes in the mountains. And my 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 wife and I we were camping before we moved here actually it was just a few weeks and we were um sitting by the fire uh, on the lake shore watching uh the lake and just enjoying ourselves and a craft uh came down over the lake and it it looked just like the things that are in the you know the pictures it was a saucer that was as big as uh, the lake probably is, i'd say 15 20 miles across um over 10 anyway um or large and uh you know it it settled down um seemed not that far above us again it could be the size or whatever but the odd thing was that we couldn't move but both of us there was we didn't talk we we had our camera phones nearby we and and I I believe we were scanned. We were being scanned, and under some kind of um, tractor beam or control or something, because there was you, you're just sitting there like this, and we we're like that, you know. And and um, I, there was no light, light around us that I could remember. But we, I, however long that craft uh, stood there and slowly vibrated, it had red like red like windows around the um, metallic like body of a giant saucer that was just sitting in um, stationary in, in, in the air but slowly spinning around slowly like rotating like this that you could see the rotation and um, however long it lasted I, I don't know because the time sort of stood still uh, for that that time when we're we're looking at it and not like you would tip hey what you see look look that wasn't possible we were we were um frozen um and um then the uh the craft started uh slowly moving upward uh i guess it decided it would didn't want to take us i always say that maybe we were too too much into the okanagan red wine i don't know whatever but uh uh, I should bring that up, but we 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 weren't drunk or anything like that, you know. But the um the 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 craft started to rise further and further. And then it went, you know, it became um a, a, just a dot in the sky, like it really uh, accelerated after the first uh, say fifty twenty feet, um accelerated faster and faster, and then it was just a, a star in the sky, and then the star went out like that, and then at that point we both snapped out of our our dreamlike state and uh looked at each other said did you see that did, did you know and we she said yeah we i saw that we can't believe it and we we we've we've talked about it several times and lots of times since that time and we both saw the exact same thing it was we could describe it exactly the same way and we both felt that same feeling that we you know there was no taking a picture there was no movement there was no talking so whatever they whatever happened that's that's who it was uh, you know so we we're still conscious but uh yeah it was uh, <laughs> did you experience any amount of missing time well yeah like that that missing time was was there i, I you know I, 
I wish I would have known a little bit more about how how long that that took. But I that was a, a timeless moment when we were sitting there and watching it. I there's no break in that time, but I don't know how long that time took. Like whether it was just thirty seconds or whether it was fifteen minutes, I don't know. Hmm. It uh, it was it, I I would say it was longer than it was just one of those things you couldn't you couldn't really judge how how much time had passed while that thing was looking at us. I, I guess the the fire had burned down quite a bit, but not that much. But pro, pro, probably about ten minutes worth of fire burn. Hmm. I would say that was yeah because I I. I I, it was interesting you just brought that question up, but I, I remember that the fire was burnt down, like there hadn't been a log thrown in for a while. So it must have been at least 10 minutes that we were in that zone. But well, I, I, I believe we weren't, like maybe if like abduction stories are true, that they that we were considered for abduction, but we were rejected. That, that's what I guess <laughs> I think. I don't know if that's true or not. But since that time, I have, have no doubt that uh, uh, there are things such as UFOs out there and extraterrestrials have probably been at this earth for as long as, maybe longer than we've been here. Again, like it's just similar to no no doubt for me that there is life, there is a life after death, There's there, that the body dies, but the spirit lives on. And uh, <clears throat> similar with the with UFOs, if you've had an experience like that, you have you have absolute certainty that that was real. That was not uh, not a fake. <laughs> what was the title of your book again? And if people want to find out more about it, can they find it yeah, on thanks, Amazon? Thanks, yes, you can. Yeah, uh, it's called the Five Card Pentagram Tarot. All right. The Five Card Pentagram Tarot, and it's a a book. Here, I'll show it to you. It's just like this. And it's it's a self help book about the tarot, so uh, you can. This book shows you, in fact, how to metaphysically engage with the tarot, and uh, draw five cards, one part from each part of the tarot, um, because there's the spirit, the health, the mind, the money, and the emotions. Lay it out in a five card pentagram shape, which is an ancient symbol of protection and good fortune, and then take a look at the book. What each of your cards says about your condition right now and where you should go forward so it uh it kind of um gives you timely advice uh, I, I i did it that way so that they could you could get something out of this and you know like when i explain the tarot it, it's like explaining human nature i think that's why the tarot works so well as a divinatory medium because the cards that those 78 cards in the tarot deck are a, a graphical representation of the human condition. And I always call it, a, who knows where it came from, but it's ancient and it's adaptable to different times in life. But the basic principle or theme of the, of the tarot deck, the 78 cards and the numbers, the, the way that it relates to the astrological signs and everything else, um, is fundamentally a, a, a guide to what it means to be human. And it covers your spirit, your mind, your emotions, your material possessions. It has all the aspects. And the, the ancient, um, of course, the pentagram shape is the pentagram, sh the, the shape of man, humankind's head, arms, legs, like that, the, uh, the thing. Uh, so um, I, I, I know the the book, uh, my, my, my purpose behind it was so that people could become closer to the universe or the or god or the the, the great spirit however you look at it um uh, th through through the use of the tarot and understand the human condition more and the and our mortality and uh the archetypes of of uh being and what we all must go through as human beings on this plane yeah my next book's going to be deeper, but this one is is a very useful book. I think it just you can get you can get out of it right away. You can uh, engage with the tarot deck and um, see what uh, what your future might hold, mm -hmm. and uh, also learn about how to deal with it. Well, you mentioned that you were a musician playing down at the farmers market. What type of music do you play? <laughs> That's right. 
Well, I, I play Western Canadian roots music, but all kinds of music is what I play. But uh, my 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 focus is on uh, writing songs about the history and people and culture and whatnot of where I live, what I know, uh, Western Canada. Uh, anyway, like a, a lot of psychics are also musicians or musicians are also a lot of psychic, I think, because we're sort of intuitive, especially songwriters, you're grabbing... You're, uh, the best songs are the ones that are your clear channel for just for a message from the universe coming down and you're, you know where the e ego starts and ends um, the, the best playing like and the best readings that I do are, are when I'm when I'm almost vacant when I'm clear when I'm not thinking about um, anything but the moment and what's coming down through to me so um, I, I do find them very similar, uh, they have complementary things, uh, being, a, being a psychic and a card reader and also a performing musician, which I've been my whole life and continue to do. So if people want to uh, check out my music, um, they can go to marvmatura.com or look me up on any of the, the uh, uh, sites that stream music or YouTube, which has all my YouTube videos are there. I also have some psychic videos there too on my channel, like how to shuffle the tarot cards and how to read the cards and about my new book. So, uh, you know, I guess the YouTube is the, my, my channel on YouTube has all of that stuff, more music than anything else, but, but there is the psychic stuff there too. Um, yeah. So thank of Thanks Jeff for the, bringing that up. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Mm -hmm. Are you open to that? And if so, how do they contact you? Okay, so uh, you can contact me uh, through my website, uh, Universe Psychic, a uh, little dash between them, dot com. So um, always open and always will answer. <laughs> Uh, you can join my email list or who knows, maybe you want to uh, get together for a reading so you can schedule a time there on my website when I'm available and we could uh, meet up. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Sure. <clears throat> uh, so remember that uh, he, we are children of the universe and we have a right to be here. Everything happens for a reason uh, and life is good. Marv, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. You're very welcome, Jeff. It's been, been a pleasure. You're a great host. Well, thank you. Great you show. All the thank, best. Thank you very much. Travel along. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.